no, 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 Hello there, I'm Aiden, and welcome to A Pastor's Life For Me. A topic that's come up quite often on this channel is us being lights of the world. I mean, we're five videos in and I've already talked about it twice. This comes out of Matthew chapter five, verses 14 through 16. So I thought to myself, maybe, just maybe, we should look into this topic. Now, as lights of the world, what is our function? But in the context of the passage, Jesus actually uses two analogies. He uses salt and light. So it seemed to be only fitting that we would first take a dive and see what does it mean for us to be salt of the earth? This topic's actually pretty interesting because people go in many different directions with it. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. If salt has lost its saltiness, how can it be restored? It is no longer good for anything and should be thrown out to be trampled by people's feet. The first question that should arise is, what does it mean for us to be salt of the earth? I really liked what John MacArthur said in his intro to these verses. So the passage says, you are the salt of the earth, not you should be the salt of the earth, or here's how to be the salt of the earth. No, it says, you are. And MacArthur says, our stress is being rather than doing. Jesus is stating a fact, not giving a command or a request. Salt and light represent what Christians are. The only question, as Jesus is going on to say, is whether or not we are tasteful salt and effective light. The very fact that we belong to Jesus Christ makes us salt and light of the world. So the question is not, are you gonna be salt and light? Rather, are you going to be faithful as salt and light? Now, salt was very important to the ancient world. In fact, during the Roman Empire, Roman soldiers would often be paid in salt. And some think that this is where the phrase, he's not worth his weight in salt, came from. So, how does this pertain to us? Salt is extremely useful, even to us today. We, as the collective church, and individually, are very useful to the world. And this is where we get into where people debate as to what does it mean to be salt? Some argue that salt speaks of purity because of its white color. And we as Christians are called to be pure repeatedly through the Bible. Some argue that salt flavors. A bowl of soup or even just general baking would not taste nearly as good without the salt. Salt adds this flavor that enriches the taste of food. In the same way, Christians bring blessing unto the world as salt brings flavor to food. And we are to bring blessing to the world through the good news that Jesus Christ died to save sinners. And this reaches all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, where God tells Abraham that through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And so like salt flavors food, we as Christians bring blessing to the world. Some argue that salt stings. And this is where I found it to get really interesting. Salt actually has a bunch of medical benefits. Our bodies need salt to survive. When you go to the hospital and you get an IV in your arm, they will usually give you saline. And saline is a mixture of sodium chloride, salt, and water. It's used to stop you from becoming dehydrated, as well as it keeps your electrolyte levels up. It's also used to clean wounds, it's used in eye drops and nasal sprays and other things. They say that people who go sailing on bodies of salt water rarely get colds because of the salty moisture in the air. So salt has many medical benefits, and this relates to us because we are the only ones who know where the true source of healing comes from. It is not an outward healing that the world needs, but an inward one. And often when we try and bring healing to the world by sharing the gospel, it stings. It stings those whom we share it with. They have a wound that desperately needs healing. But because they either don't believe that they have a wound or the sting of the truth turns them away, 
they do not come to the only source of true healing there is. And they desperately, desperately need it. Some argue that salt creates thirst. If you get stranded in the middle of the ocean or on a remote island, one of the worst things that you can do is drink salt water. The salt in the water will make you dehydrate faster than if you didn't drink it. Your body needs to produce more water than it actually has to be able to filter that salt water. And that salt water will give you a greater thirst. As the salt of the earth, we create thirst in others. Jesus says to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst again. Jesus is the living water and it's only through him that we can be saved. When we live as we are called to, we will cause people to be thirsty for the only water that satisfies. And just like healing, people are going to react negatively to this. They will either deny that there is even a thirst, or they will turn to the things of this world to quench their thirst. But ultimately, they are drinking poison and rejecting the only water that can save them. Everybody has a wound, and everybody is thirsty. But Jesus is the only one who can satisfy. If I'm going to be totally transparent, I didn't plan on doing this, but something that I've been struggling with lately is seeing people who desperately, desperately need the gospel. They have this wound that needs to be healed. They have this thirst that needs to be quenched. And I'm at a college where I'm the only Christian in my class. And the guys that I study with, they're all about living the life. Look into the weekend so that they can party and get drunk and just live like the world tells them to. And you see it and it puts an ache in your heart. And you see that this void that they're trying to fill with the pleasures of this world can actually be filled with God. And I'm pretty sure by now they all know where I stand. I was reading MacArthur's commentary on this passage and I had the book right there in front of the desk for everybody to see if they wanted to look over. I'm not quiet about it. We're allowed to have a Bluetooth speaker in our welding booths and I'm listening through the Bible right now. I find it amazing and a real blessing that I'm actually able to do that. But I look at these guys and I see a desperate, desperate need for healing. And it's hard when you know that they just really don't want it. They don't want their lives to change. You know, we're young, we're free. But if you could keep me in your prayers, as I try and witness to these guys and you know, try to tell them about the gospel, place a little bit of salt in their wounds. Give them a little salt in their drinks to make them thirsty. Wherever you go, be the salt and the light of the world. Because the world desperately needs Jesus. There are those who will feel the sting of their wound from the salt. And those who will feel the ache in their throat from the thirst. And they will come to Jesus for healing. This leads us into the final purpose of salt, preservation. It's only a few hundred years ago that freezers did not exist. And unless you lived in a place where there was constant freezing temperature, you couldn't preserve your meat like we do today. But salt preserves. And what they would do is they would pack salt around the meat to preserve it, to stop it from rotting. And they would put salt in the meat and they would dehydrate it to make jerky, which can last without being cooled. And we are called the salt of the earth, meaning we preserve the earth. Well, how, Aiden? How do we preserve the earth? There's a question that gets asked relatively often. Why hasn't God put an end to it all? With all the sin and destruction in this world, why hasn't God put an end to it? I mean, in his word, he says that he's going to, but why hasn't he done it yet? And the answer is actually quite simple, because there is still work to be done. There is still work to be done. 
God is not done saving people. We're still looking out for that harvest because there is more wheat to grow among the thistles. There are still names in the book of life who have not yet been saved. And so there is still work to do. So we as salt preserve the earth because we make people thirsty for the gospel by giving the sting of the truth to those who desperately need it. We bring blessing to the earth through the proclamation of the gospel so that those who are drenched in the red of sin would be washed in the blood of Christ and become pure. Us being salt, it isn't just one thing. It's all of them combined and probably even more so that the great commission would be fulfilled. So that we would go into all the world and be salt and light, bringing the good news that Jesus Christ die to save sinners like you and me. So what does it mean to be salt? It means that our very lives are a testimony of the gospel and of God's abundant grace. We're a testimony to the whole world. And that is something we're going to dive into in our next video in part two of this series on what it means to be salt and light. <laughs> So glad that you took this time to join us. Leave a like and drop a comment below. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and ding that bell so you don't miss our next one. But until next time, remember that we are the salt of the earth. And so we are to know the word, do the word, and share the word. But as always, we do it in love. <laughs>